Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm here today with Joel. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Christian. Good so to what, finally uh, yeah. meet you in person here, or in person remotely, I should say. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> We're, well, this is the new normal of this is in person. So yeah. Well, for for those that don't know you, know who you are. Why don't you describe who you are, where you are, what you do? I'm based in South Carolina, and I work for Hitachi Solutions. I've been an MVP for. 13 years now, I think it is, about where the uh, the discs are about to start falling off the off of the uh, trophy or whatever. You've got the two blue rings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, got the two, I've got the two blue rings. I'm about uh, about two years away from the third one, yeah. And then when you reach the third one, then you got to decide, do I take the blue rings out to make them fit, or do I maybe go stack them along the top? Lay it, lay it sideways. You've got more <laughs> surface there, you know. If, yeah. you, if people that don't know what you're talking about here... <laughs> now i don't know about you like when, when was your first mvp award christian uh, 2012 okay so my first one was 20 2008 i'm not saying that because i've well i've been a long time but they yeah, didn't start the humble brag. i think that's what that's called yeah yeah, yeah that was my <laughs> my my humble brag exactly but they didn't start the rings until 2010 mm. and so i have two missing rings and it irks me to no end because the completest it, i hate seeing like ring 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 five years that it just it i need right. to find somebody who can who can fabricate those rings and make me a 2008 Three, you, you don't have access somewhere for to a, a 3d printer i'm sure I, I i i that's a good thought we should 3d 3d print them or something yeah but no i've i've originally was awarded for dynamic crm um and if you know anything about the business applications world um that has now grown significantly to also also factor in power platform so i'm considered a business applications mvp and so it's become a hot property over there because it's so i'm trying to remember when the microsoft acquired all the dynamic stuff so i was an employee in 2006 so it happened right right down there at the sometime right right around that time yeah it was actually um and this this is going to date me significantly, but it was early 2000s, and actually Dynamic CRM was a kind of an organic product that they they developed themselves. The others like um, AX, which is now FNO, and Division and GP, they acquired all those. But, uh, okay. but yeah, Dynamic CRM that was something. I mean, they built it with partners, but it was really okay. Was I didn't Microsoft I didn't that, realize that. I thought that also came through the Great Pins acquisition, but all right, yeah. Yeah, I know. And that's where you know, kind of the what they call the common data service grew out of what the Dynamic 365 database was. And so that's where the power platform world is just is still a little bit bifurcated where a, a lot of the like power apps grew out of SharePoint. You know, SharePoint was the first platform to adopt flow as its main workflow engine. And so as a result, a lot of the initial MVPs were on the on the um SharePoint side, and then when they brought in CDS 2.0 in 2018, that opened the door for Dynamics people, and there still is a little bit of a bifurcation there where people who came to it from a SharePoint side are trying to use Office. Now we've got CDS, and then you've got the, the CRM people who are don't really understand the Office world as much, although we're, we're, we're learning, and I'm kind of bridging both worlds now, so, you know, we're delivering delivering power apps to customers that don't have CDS as well as people that have CDS and dynamics. And um, I think that vision is increasingly coming clearer and becoming more reunified thing. Yeah, that's, that's, I was going to ask you about that with your, your experience. I mean, so there's a, like, so here in where I am in, in Utah, of course, we've got a number of small, uh, you know, SIs, uh, consulting firms that have been long time uh, SharePoint uh, businesses and, uh, doing a lot of that that kind of work well, as custom SharePoint, a lot of the on-prem work and that all has gone kind of, of down and and some of them have retooled. Well, the large one of the larger uh, vendors in in town, a company called Journey Team, they've mm -hmm. shifted over. They shifted a few years back over to the Dynamics. Their business is booming, 
Right. And so they, their little division is like the SharePoint portal collaboration side of things, which is kind of my world. Uh, and, uh, and they're really just, uh, they're, they're growing leaps and bounds uh, on the other side of the business. And they're, you know, I don't know, they're going to double here. But well, before all this pandemic stuff happened, they, they were going to like almost double in employees this year. So, wow. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's something that, growth. and I think that's where kind of the realization to me is you know, the average, I think the average dynamics implementation is in the, you know, is in the hundreds of users. You know, it's, it's, you've got some that are small, some SMC stuff, but probably the average that we see for dynamics deployment is somewhere in the 500 to 1,000 users. And then they've got some that are 3,000, 5,000. I mean, but we're, we're talking power apps deployments that are in the 10,000 or more users. And that's where Microsoft really sees this platform as even a much bigger pool or bigger opportunity than what business applications have been for them. And they have yeah, so yeah. much legacy stuff out there with InfoPath and Access and Excel and all that other stuff that there's plenty of opportunity. But the, the, the realization is, you know, the, the initial power apps for a lot of personal productivity stuff, which are great. And I, I mean, I've built the food tracker app for myself and things like that. But the reality is that's not the real opportunity. It's not the free or, you know, not the five user, you know, productivity type apps. It's the opportunity to have somebody have a timesheet app that's used by 20,000 people. You know, right. that's the real opportunity. Right. Well, I guess the next question is about the stuff that you do in the day-to-day -day job. I mean, so how, you know, what are you, what are you primarily focused on? Uh, what kind of projects are you seeing? You know, that, that's always a, a, a good sign of the adoption of what's happened out in industry is, you know, what, what projects are the consulting companies starting to pick up? So I'm, yeah, so my job has changed somewhat in that, you know, I've been, I, I've had every, almost every job on our, uh, on our CRM team, if you use the old term, uh, except for, except for being a project manager, I would be a terrible project manager. If you're a project manager, you basically have to be, be like nervous about everything all the time. <laughs> I'm just not that way. Yep, uh, yep. It's the worst but, part of that job is, is chasing people for status updates. Yes. Yes. This is the, this is my quote for every project manager. I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. You're you, you, that's right. You have uh, responsibility for everything. They got to see the icebergs that are coming, you know, oh, yeah. that's right. Well, but, yeah. um, you know, yeah, you know, the poster I have on my wall over here. <laughs> I mean, I at my it. heart, I'm a, I'm a solution architect and, and what, it's the despair.com poster problem. Yeah. No matter how great and destructive your problems may seem now, remember you've probably only seen the tip of them. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. But I was saying at, at my heart, I'm a, I'm a solution architect, which means um, I am not a developer. I've never claimed to be a developer. I've dabbled in it, but I never had, it's kind of the same reason I'm not an accountant. I don't like to go through a, a problem at the granular level. I like to jump to the solution and design what the, what it, what it looks like. Um, but I so but my job has now changed. I'm the principal power platform architect for Hitachi North America. So that means that I'm setting the vision for how can we bridge these worlds and how can we you know grow. And we've seen tremendous growth with Power Automate, Power Apps. We have another group that does Power BI. I've never. I've done reporting, but um, it's not my main focus. Yeah. And there, are, hey, there are a few other uh, Hitachi MVPs, aren't there? Yeah, we actually have more business applications MVPs than any other partner. Oh, and it cool. um, hasn't been that way forever. But um, yeah, some of them have come as, it's like the more MVPs that we've, we've grown organically, the more want to come work for us because they realize that we support MVPs and the things that MVPs like to do, like speaking at conferences when there's not pandemics going on or, right. uh, you know, doing podcasts and other things like that. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of leading partners sabotage themselves by having the social media police and everything that people post has to be branded with rah, rah, my company. Right. But what we found is you get a lot more, you, you get a lot more mileage from just having people who are great people who know what they're talking about 
And if you have somebody speaking at Ignite or other things like that, that's a much better, that's a much better advertisement for your company than posting canned things that your marketing department has put out. Well, people see through the, 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 it's, it's about authenticity and, and people, uh, you know, recognize it. I I, mean, I had this, I don't know if you remember the company I, I worked for a, was based in Seattle, but working for Boston based Exceller. Okay. And, and they, they were fantastic in their attitude towards, they said, look, I don't understand a lot of this stuff, but they were, as we started, we're measuring. And I remember having a conversation with their VP of sales about a year after they acquired the little company that I was working for in Seattle. And, and he said, you know, Hey, want to apologize now, which were like, must've been poison out of his mouth to say that now, good friend. <laughs> but he, uh, he said, um, you're like we're we're seeing the data now. Like we're we're seeing now the impact of the. I was the chief evangelist for it, but it was you know product marketing and and um, he says we we see that your your hand in almost every single sale that we make. So we we're seeing now the impact of those different pieces. You know attribution is a difficult thing to to measure, but they and in fact they when they hired a new CMO and the first thing she said was, um, you know look says I may not agree with some of the things that you're you're doing dollars spent it's like but the results are there we're not going to change anything in fact I want you to do more of what you what you're doing which was fantastic support um and and I found most other organizations that I've worked with um that there that's been more you know the other executives have been you know been jealous of that because they don't understand how that works and then like you said they want to go and brand everything you must be wearing our logo uh we don't want you blogging on your own it must be through our site i mean kind of all those kinds of problems and they they kill it people see right through that it's not authentic um it doesn't allow uh for the natural interaction of your people no matter what their role is uh, yeah, to uh, to interact with the community and it kills it. It stops it. Yeah, well, I think I've what I've experienced is is that too. And I've had times where I've had in other companies management that wasn't supportive of that. But I'm I'm a fan of Jocko Willink, and he talks about leadership leading forward. And as somebody who either is an MVP or wants to wants to do the community, you put yourself in their, their shoes. You know, if you had a bunch of people kind of going off and doing their own thing, there's a risk there or a perceived okay. risk there. But, you know, I think if it is possible, and I have seen it happen firsthand for you to train your employer, in other words, show them, Hey, here's the value that comes and, you know, and, and do that. But it saddens me sometimes when I see certain partners that used to be really strong you'd go to uh, the user group summit or you would go to ignite or or back when we had convergence and they had a lot of people that really knew what they were talking about and now you go and there's all these just marketing people right it just it just is not i don't see how that that's effective or it's much more effective to use the best asset you have which is your people right well it, it's it's funny I, it, so i had uh, i remember um you know uh, so I had my MVP for, so this must've been like 2013, 2014. And somebody came up, I was doing like, I think one of the SharePoint Fest events or something. And after I, I presented on a, a topic and came up and said, um, I have no idea what your company does. So you just spoke on this topic. You know, <laughs> what was it? It was like an administrative. I said, well, I said, that's the thing. I said, I, there was zero pitch in any of my presentations. I would go and talk about actual problems. Hey, this is what the gaps are in the product. Here's what needs to be there. And, and so even though I was, I was trying to be, uh, and this is I think guidance for anybody that wants to, you know, uh, uh, like create content and do things that uh, maybe they feel that they're on the path. They want to become an MVP or they just want to give back to the community, but do it in, in a way that's not heavy handed towards your product or service. Here's the secret is that everybody knows that you work for a company, whether it's your own or somewhere else, and ultimately you wanna sell a product or service. Right, and they also know that everybody yeah. thinks they have a unique 
a neat, unique approach and that right. everybody thinks they're the best at everything. And Right. But you don't yeah, need to go in then heavy handedly, you know, add in like, and here's what we do and here's what we do and here's what our product did. It's like, no, you right. can, you can talk about and educate. And what I, my, again, my experience was it led to then those conversations where somebody would say like, I don't even know what you guys do. What do you do? I said, well, let me tell you, uh, not up on stage. <laughs> This is in the hallway afterwards, and it led to an organic conversation. We build the products that do these things. This is why I'm talking on this this topic. But uh, and then let's have a conversation. What are you experiencing here? You resonated with the topic. Here's our yeah, solution. Think, let's have. A I think it's the same same thing. Companies and people who've been. <laughs> I don't want to say influencers, but um, MVPs and other, other things like that. There's a point where you start believing your own hype, where you're uh, shifting it to MVPs, where the, about around year three or four, the, um, the imposter syndrome can turn into arrogance, <laughs> where you get a lot of affirmation, where you go to events and you, people come up and say, I've been, I've been listening to your podcast for years, Christian. It's awesome. I feel like, you know, you're, I'm the only person who does this in my company. And, and, you know, I'm sure you have conversations like that, or, you know, it's like you start thinking you're pretty hot stuff. And that's where, that's where you can jump the shark really easily. Yeah. And that's well, where well, I don't know if you, you've seen Joel, like the stickers that I did. Well, that's why I created exactly that line was the, these, these stickers. You mean these stickers? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. I sent you one. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And it's it's kind of like that's where, you know, and I, I don't want to talk poorly badly about people in the in the MVP MVP group, but you think that people feel entitled to have a free license for everything. And yeah. you know, really, when it comes down to it, we're unpaid PR people. <laughs> you know, yeah. and we try and be authentic and try and say what we think. But, you know, we're there at Microsoft's Goodwill and, um, you know, within our worlds, we may be, you know, we may be minor celebrities, but outside of that, you know, you're not. So yeah. having that perspective, but I think that translates to company as well and that recognizing, and that's where I think being in, in a group like uh, in a community like the MVP community gives you appreciation that those people that we trash and say are our competitors aren't as good at us. They got some really smart people. And some of those people know certain things I don't. And we have people that know things they don't. And it's a big enough market for everybody to succeed. Yeah. You know, there's, I have to say that the, uh, um, not, not my interactions in the MVP community, the vast majority of people that we interact with, you know, are, are fairly humble about, you know, wh where they are, that they, you know, had this, got this award and they're able to participate in this community and some of the perks of it, like, like the in-person MVP summit, it's really going to be tough to do it again, uh, you know, virtual and not yeah. be able to have those interactions, but we'll get back there someday. But, uh, but yeah, there, there's some great people and, uh, and whether you're an MVP or not, uh, just to go and reach out to the, the vast majority are connector personality types. They are, uh, you know, social people who are willing to, and are are openly like asking, like, send me your questions. How can I help you? Uh, right. They're just that that kind of personality, and uh, and that's been that's been great. Uh, you, so you get the the occasional uh, um, jerks within any community. Um, it's it's going to happen, but uh, yeah, I. I I remember, and I don't know if, if 2012 if this was happening in, in your part of the MVP program. Were you ever involved when, um, was that after, um, was that, that after Balmer left or was, was that before Balmer left? Uh, so that was, uh, I think it was right around that time. I, I don't remember. First couple of MVP summits, they had, uh, they had an open mic with Steve Balmer. And people, people could line up and ask whatever question they want. And at that time, they had MVPs for consumer technologies, like Microsoft Money had MVPs. And I remember vividly one of the MVPs almost breaking down in tears about Microsoft discontinuing Microsoft Money. And it was, it was sometimes there was, there was like a, 
a, a pitchforks and torches mentality at, at MVP Summit because people would bring their their list of problems or things that that irked them and be very very passionate about it. And well, uh, th that yeah, that I'm continued for quite a few years. In <laughs> fact, uh, I I tell some newer MVPs that uh, you know like uh, uh, like here's a great example after the Yammer acquisition. Uh, to, to, to talk about Yammer in a room full of SharePoint people was a dangerous <laughs> proposition Yeah, at, uh, right? at the MVP summit. But for those of us that were kind of sitting about in the back and I'm, look, I'm, I've been a, a, you know, a Yammer advocate prior to the acquisition and there's been some problems, but I'm a fan of the, the technology. But that was some good entertainment, like Jerry Springer type entertainment <laughs> at the MVP summit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But good times, good times. Well, uh, you know, so how else, uh, so what are you out presenting on now? Kind of what are the topics that you're out uh, doing events? I'm, I'm imagining you're doing a lot of online <laughs> events now, like all of us. Yeah. So uh, I haven't, well, I've, I've had user group presentations and other things like that. I was supposed to be at Ignite the Tour in Chicago next week, but that's yeah. not happening. Yeah. Um, I was supposed and, to be in India for Ignite the Tour, so. Really? Wow. I was disappointed. I, I was looking forward to that, getting back there. So that last time I was there was Yeah, I've been to Chicago before. I've never been to India, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love it there. Um, but, yeah, so other what I'm doing, um, last year I, I had kind of an event heavy, at least for me. Uh, I did, you know, Ignite. I did User Group Summit, which is the big business applications. I did several other conferences like that, um, attended Build. Um, so, but beyond that, most of my contributions are through CRM Audio is my podcast network, uh, where we almost every week have at least one episode. And then um, I also, uh, way back in 2013, uh, George Dubinsky, one of the Australian MVPs, started this uh, a tip of the, a daily tip site modeled after that time there was an office kind of tip of the day. And we've kept that going unbelievably for what eight years now <laughs> and we're up to like 1400 tips um and so you know those are those are some of the main things that i do but uh, as far as other things um i'm taking some of the events that we do around power platform and doing a virtual version of them so there's the app in a day we've done several of those um there's a bunch of other in a day type hands-on lab events that i find I are, love those, are great that kind of content those are great yeah but there's the Power Virtual Agents is the kind of newest member of the Power Platform family. And so there's a curriculum in that. There's Power Automate in a day and Customer Insights in a day and some of the other ones. That's what I'm trying to get into uh, because I think the app in a day is great, but, and they do update it. They, I know, I know the people update it and they, they're regularly updating and bringing new technologies, but there's so much more in the Power Platform beyond just Power Apps that um, you know, giving people the option, an easy way to do that. And it was kind of interesting. I was kind of nervous going in doing one of these remotely because you know, they're very interactive. You have people, I'm stuck, how do I do that? Usually people miss a step in the hands-on lab. Right. Um, but uh, what, what I did is kind of shook up the, what I found is people don't like to be on a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting for eight hours. I think the virtual MVP summit taught us that. Right. <laughs> I was, I don't know about you, but I was I was dead after it, each of the it, right. Well, because the other side of it too is that you know usually during the the summit, I mean, you're you're going through there might be five or six sessions in a day, but you're breaking that up with other conversations and meetings, and there's events in the evening, and it breaks it up slightly different. But the or you might skip a content session and just be out in the hall in a deep conversation with fellow MVPs or Microsoft people, and here just consuming it, not having some of those other interactions. But because the way that they split it up to serve, you know, uh, North America and EMEA and then APAC in the evening, I found that I was just doubling up on content. Yeah. So it made for some yeah, me too. long days. Me too. And I thought the evening sessions, some of them were better because they had had a rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> Good you know, point. it was like the yeah. first session, something would go wrong. And then the second session, they had it working. So um, anyway, next, I guess it's uh, uh, two weeks from now on the 21st, we're doing the uh, virtual app in a day or virtual uh, virtual agents, which is the visual bot bot 
uh, framework that works with flow. So okay. um, that's something. So that's easy to do. I just try and what I tell people, um, and I've been able to mentor 13 people to become MVPs now. And what I tell them is just, just try and do some kind of contribution every week and make it part of your schedule. So that might be writing a blog, that might be a podcast, that might be a YouTube video, you know, a number of different things. There's so many more things. I mean, when I started, it was basically forums and, and writing blogs. Now there's just so much other stuff to do. Yeah. Um, but I am seeing the whole COVID-19 thing and everybody work from home. Uh, you know, I'm seeing like, it seems like podcasts and YouTube videos are, are getting much, getting, getting a sizable decrease in some of their audiences because I don't know about you, but I don't, I generally don't listen to podcasts when I'm just working from home all the time. I've actually increased my podcast. Really? And I'll sit there and we're working on something and I'll have, you know, on my phone over on the side and, and sometimes even with music going at the, at the same time. But, uh, now I've, I've found that it's, uh, you know, I, and, and I'm walking a lot further with my dogs. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. I should that way. I should so. listen to him while I'm walking my dog. Yeah, that's I, I'm doing that more than anything. So I'm I'm doing five six miles a day um, wow. with the dogs, and so I'm get through two or three podcasts in that time. So, well, Joel, I I, I really appreciate the time today. People want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. What are the best ways to reach you? Um, I do a lot of LinkedIn. I find that's probably the one I do the most. I'm also on Twitter. Either one of those is fine. Also, um, CRM.audio is, is the podcast if you want to subscribe and learn about all things uh, Power Platform and Dynamics. Very cool. Well, Joel, well, really appreciate your time and have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy out there. Yeah, thanks, Christian. <laughs>